You sure? Yes. Okay. Om Stapakaya Chaturamasya Savadama Sarupine Avatara Varishtaya Ramakrishnaya Tainamaha Om Sarva Mangala Manga Ye Shive Savarta Sarike Sharane Trambake Gori Narayana Mostu Te Jaya Narayana Mostu Te Jaya Narayana Mostu Te Jaya Narayana Mostu Te Om Namah Shriyati Rajaya Vivekananda Suraye Satchit Sukha Sarupaya Swamine Tapaharine Swamine Tapaharine Om Salutation to Sri Ramakrishna, Sri Sarda Devi and Swami Vivekananda who came to reestablish Dharma and to enlighten the world. Om peace, peace, peace be unto us all. Well, I'm hi. I'm <laughs> as we Americans say, hi. <laughs> I'm really glad to be back in Pittsburgh again. I love this group. It's so energetic and interested and informal and fun. And it's great to be among friends again. And I'm talking about something that obviously has a direct personal connection for me as, uh, as an American and as a woman. Uh, obviously, I have a deep and very direct interest in the topic because had Swami Vivekananda never come to this country, I would not be here today. There's absolutely no chance there would be women brahmacharinis or sannyasinis there would be absolutely no chance of me or anyone else having this opportunity to take up a life of service and renunciation that is given by the Ramakrishna mission. It is only through the enormous, infinite grace of Shama Krishna, Sri Sarda Devi, and Swami Vivekananda that I have the privilege of wearing this color and being with you today. And never, I never, never, never take that for granted. It was just the most outrageous thing that Swamiji was able to pull off because only he could pull it off. <laughs> he had that kind of courage and chutzpah, as we say in Yiddish, to be able to do it. You know, now we kind of take women's sannyasa for granted. It is a tradition that does not exist in America, obviously. It also didn't exist in Bengal. So when Swami Vivekananda did it, it was met with a great deal of outrage and disbelief. In fact, Allah Singha wrote him some sort of a letter in complete shock because something from the New York Herald had appeared, had a, something about a Swami, had Swami Vivekananda had given, uh, had started a, a, a woman became a, a Hindu monk. And this had reached, of course, India. So, uh, Allah Singha, who was a deeply devoted disciple of Swami Vivekananda, a good South Indian Brahmin, was obviously had shocked to death. And he wrote this very alarmed letter to Swami Vivekananda. And of course, nothing could have made Swamiji happier than to shock somebody. <laughs> and he sort of breezily replied, he said, one of my new sannyasinis is indeed a woman. And it's like, you can see, you can feel the shock waves coming off the letter. It's like, you, what? You, what? And, and, you know, Swamiji had said, well, my next mission is the Mars. You know, that would have, that would have been somewhere in the same, in the same level of you're doing what? It was literally unthinkable. But Swamiji totally waved out any opposition that he got, which was plenty. And he's the only person, truly the only person in India who could have leveled that playing field. He's the only one who could have pulled it off because of his immense courage and his dogged determination and because he had the power of Takur and Mother behind him. He had the divine mother like, yeah, this is the way to go. So, uh, he had this, of course, when he got back, he, his letters to, um, oh, come on, in his letters to his disciple, what is that, his disciple's name, not Cha, um, Ch Chakravarti, yeah, Chakravarti. So you read this correspondence and Swamiji's, his answers to him were like, 
wasn't correspondence, it was his notes from the disciple, Sart Ch Chandra Chakravarti. He said, Swamiji said, sannyasa is recognized in the Vedas without making any distinction between men and women. And Swamiji wasn't even beginning to finish that topic. He was just warming up. And he said, he said, do you remember how young Yavalkya was questioned at the court of King Janaka? He said his principal examiner was, uh, was Vachaknavi. I don't, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce that. Vachaknavi? Vachaknavi? Yeah, he said the maiden orator. He said her gender is not even commented upon in the Vedas. And he said, again, could anything be more complete than the equality of boys and girls in our old forest universities? I mean, that's pretty amazing. And Swamiji had that and he was like, his ammunition was locked and loaded. He was like, I'm going, because he knew his time was short and he was gonna make sure this happened. You know, forest universities were not a matter of experience in America but he decided to make it happen in America before it even happened in India. He, he deeply, Swamiji deeply believed in the innate freedom of the human soul. And he was gonna do everything he could to make that happen. And the most important freedom to him was not social freedom, which was important to him. Educational freedom, deeply important to him, but spiritual freedom is what his great mission in life was. And he was gonna make sure that women had the opportunity to experience the highest spiritual freedom. He, he was going to do that no matter what. And for that purpose, he gave Swami Abhayananda, Marie Louise, sannyasa in Thousand Island Park in 1895. Now, anyone could see she was not the most promising candidate. I mean, she really wasn't. But that really didn't, he really didn't care about that. What he wanted to do was to set, set an example, to, to have a precedent. Because once that precedent had been set by him, the toothpaste wouldn't go back in the tube again. Once that precedent had been set, it was going to stay there. And so he kept going on with that. That, that um, on the other hand, even though she was kind of like, uh, um, didn't stay in Vedanta Sannyas, Vedanta Sannyas. She became a Vaishnava later and was slightly, you know, not quite stable. She still started the first Vedanta work in Australia. And she was the, and there, uh, I heard from Saradesha Prana that, that there are people there who still have grandparents remembered her and were influenced by her in Australia. So everybody put their little seeds out in the ground where it would eventually sprout. Even with Marie Louise Swami Abhayananda, apparently an extraordinarily irritating woman. But you know, he, he knew it and he gave it to her anyway. And so that precedent has been set. And then Swamiji gave Brahmacharya to an extraordinarily promising candidate, Sister Christine in Thousand Island Park in 1895. And then at the same time, he gave the Garawa cloth of sannyasa to um, Sarah Bull. He wrapped it around, he didn't do the whole uh, home, uh, Virajahoma, but he wrapped Garawa around her. And then in 1896, he gave Brahmacharya to Ella, Sarah L Ellen Waldo, for whom we have to be grateful because she did the, the inspired talks. It was, it was because of her notes and she did so much more for there. And then I didn't even realize this until quite recently, Swami Trigunatitananda kept up that tradition. In 1908, he started a convent in San Francisco. And that was, that sort of fell apart in 1912, not only because of his own death, but a number of other factors, part of the fact they all, these women all held jobs. And it was very difficult at that time to, you know, to try to keep up a nasty thing, have a paying job, and then go, go back and do all that. And he was very strict. But the precedent had been set and set by a direct disciple of Shama Krishna. And those seeds would have to sprout. So in 1959, the great Swami Ashokananda founded again another convent in San Francisco. So it's really important to keep that, keep that in mind. In Southern California, our first brahmachari vows were given in 1947. And then the first, uh, again, in 1949, 
the, the five women who become the first brahmacharis and sannyasnis, they first got their brahmachari vows in 1949. So why did Swamiji choose American women in particular? And I think because they had much more freedom than women in other cultures. It might be because, because of our frontier background. It might be because to have been born in America, especially with people who had emigrated from another country, you had to be pretty independent and self-reliant anyway. But he, Swamiji was quite impressed with American women. He said, he wrote a letter in 1894 to his brother disciples back at Bellarmont, not Bellarmont, that would have been Alambazar or would it have been Baranagor? It must have been Baranagor. So he said, Swamiji wrote, I am really struck with wonder to see the women here, how gracious the Divine Mother is upon them. Most wonderful women, these. He was really impressed with women's independence and their strength and also their culture. Uh, when women really ended up having an absolutely critical role in Swamiji's work in the West. Without these women, the work would not have, have grown the way it did. These women were absolutely critical to his success. And that's a lot of it is simply because the nature of society where the men were at work all day long. And the women, especially educated women, had the opportunity to raise their minds, to, to do cultured things, especially if they were, they were from a wealthier strata. But even in Sister Christine's letters and notes, she, she says that even in the poor sections of New York where Swamiji was, that the women, children, and very, very poor people would just follow him. That, that they would just follow him like he was the Pied Piper. And alas, because so these people were basically illiterate, we have none of their recollections of him. But his heart, obviously his heart always bled for the poor and those who had less opportunities. They followed him around like, like, like he was human catnip. You know, <laughs> they were just following him around. It's, um, it's kind of frustrating, even though I, we're going to have two different sessions on this to talk about these Western women, American women in particular, there are so many, I just don't have the opportunity to talk about them all. But I mean, without these women, this work wouldn't be anywhere where we are today. And so it's like, I'm gonna talk about the, some of the notable ones that I think are important, but I encourage all of you, all of you out there, all of you here to, to do your own study because it's really quite amazing how much these women really sacrificed, how much they dedicated their whole lives to it and they felt nothing but joy, nothing with joy that they could do this kind of work for someone that they really don't gave their lives over to. This is what I want to do. This is something I believe in so much that I want to dedicate my whole life to it. So some of the Western women who played outsized roles, of course, the first person we think of is Nivedita. Uh, Nivedita was Swamiji's not so much daughter. She, she was his soldier. She was tough and he was really tough with her. He could be really harsh with her because she was kind of bullheaded, stubborn. And he really kind of like lowered the guns and fired at her and she'd be very upset. And then she kind of got it, but she worked, she had enormous courage and she went into situations that none of us would be able to do today. None of us would survive. She went into areas of Pog Bazaar where no white person would dip their foot into to, in order for her in the rainy season to go one part of the house to the other, she had to use an umbrella. It was, it was beastly hot in the summer, unbearable during rainy season, and she had a smile on her lips. And she did everything for the service. She gave her life on the altar of India because Swamiji told her, told her that that's what, you know, love India, serve India. And she did. And she did everything out of absolute love for Swamiji and for India. Another one who devoted herself heart and soul was Sister Christine, who devoted herself to serving the women of India because Swamiji asked her, please come and educate the women. So she dedicated herself to that heart and soul until she had to go back to America because of, America because of World War I. And then it was almost impossible for her to come back. And when she came back, it was 10 years later and the world had really changed around her. 
So she went from there to Himalayas, but her whole thing had been into um, serving, serving the women of India, which is what Swamiji particularly asked of her. And she, again, she was living right there with Nevedita. Nevedita was a tough customer and she was also a, a, a great Indian patriot. So Christina is there, she's trying to educate these women, educate these children, and she's got revolutionaries coming in and out of the house at all hours. And she's got the British police, they're on alert for the British police are like extremely suspicious about this and they would like to get Nevada to, but she can't because she's a Briton, she's Brit. And so they're watching all the people like Orobindo, all those people have to escape in the middle of the night. And, and these parents that got their children there it was an act of God to even get the children there. And in fact, the women, the families would not allow their children to go there to be educated because she was a Malecha, Nevada was a Malecha. And it wasn't until the plague where she went out herself with her hands and started cleaning up all the garbage outside and, and where all the rats were spreading the plague, cleaning it up that people realized, oh, she's different. She's not like the others. She cares about us that they started allowing their girls to go to school. Even though as Holy Mother said, how much Nevedita puts up with, she said, as soon as she leaves a place, they purify the house because her very presence. And, and she said, and Nevedita knows this, but she goes in with a smile on her face and she leaves with a smile on her face. She went all the way to Amarnath Temple with Swamiji. They wouldn't allow her in after all that hardship getting up there, not a murmur of complaint. She understood how, what the, the background was while there was such a mistrust of, 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 uh, the, of the British, of the white skin, didn't blame them at all. As Holy Mother said, she did it with a smile on her face. She considered it her privilege to serve. These women, we couldn't even begin to make sacrifices like they did. Another one, Charlotte Savior, who with her husband founded the Mayavati Ashram because Swamiji really, really wanted a whole ashram, a whole mutt dedicated to nothing but the non-dual um, Brahman. They have no shrines, no this, no that, just absolute non-dualism preached, taught, experienced there. So she was there. And within a very short period of time, Captain Savior, her husband, died. She stayed there another 15 years. And we're talking no electricity, no heat, no running water. She's a Brit and absolutely thrived there. She lived there for 15 years after her husband died. And she gave her life to doing the two things that Swamiji loved, which was serving the poor, all of her resources, all of her personal intellectual gifts went into the two things he wanted, spreading the word, spreading Vedanta. She helped edit the complete works with um, Sadhananda. No, 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 not Sadhananda. It was, okay, yeah, so, Sarupananda. Yeah, with them and, and the publication of Prabhupada Bharata which was an onerous task, getting all the material up from where it had been, Chennai, <laughs> where it had been before, and then dragging it up all the way to Mayavati, up all those hills, I mean, you could barely get a car up there. <laughs> the printing press and everything else, she did all that, and she helped, she helped financially all the poor up there. And she did it with such great joy. For 15 years, she really was critical for the publication of the complete works and for the initial publication of Prabhupada Bharata and for, and for just staying there and getting that Mayavati ashrama started, which was Swamiji's dream. And the other one is, okay, so back to America, because otherwise I could keep going on about these amazing women who sacrificed so much. Swamiji said in America, men are grinding all day at their work and have very little leisure, whereas the women have become very learned. You know, the men were considered, I mean, the men didn't really concern themselves with the things at home. The little lady will take care of the children, the cooking, the cleaning and all that. That's not their problem. Their whole thing was like being a success, making money. And also this whole thing about expanding their mind was not really a cultural value at the time for men. It was for women. It was for women. 
So our first person that we have to really give our thanks to is Kate Sanborn. Kate Sanborn was a, a fairly well-off educated woman, but what's extraordinary about her is, is her amazing open mind. Swamiji had arrived, had arrived in Chicago, and he was, um, how did, we arrived in Chicago, he didn't realize that he needed to have a letter of introduction. He also didn't realize he needed anything else, but he came, he didn't realize he was there like three months before the parliament was to begin. And his money was running out very fast. So someone told him it's cheaper in Boston. So Swami just got on a train and went to Boston. It's like, where are you going to go once you get? And Swami just never worried about that. He knew that he was being taken care of. So he gets on a train, has no idea where to go, what to do. He's sitting there with the robes on, right? It's like, okay, can you imagine all the mothers, the children and everything else, all the people like, yeah, what's that? And this Kate Sanborn comes up to him and she says, oh, where are you from? Where are you going? Blah, blah, blah. And he tells them about that. She said, please be a guest in my home. Can you imagine you see a stranger on a train dressed very strangely? You say, please come to my home. Stay as long as you'd like. Huh. You, I can't think of anyone who would do that today. They'd be terrified bringing someone unknown into a house. So she did. And it's because of her that Swamiji gave his first talk in the United States, which was at a, a women's club, a women's club. And then after that, she did the other astonishing thing. She just happened to be friends with J.H. Wright, who is a professor at Harvard University. And J.H. Wright just happened to be the person who gave the credentials to the people to speak at the parliament. Yeah, it was all about these personal connections. It was all about Sharma Krishna going, Da, 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 da. So because of that introduction, they, he met him, he liked him enormously. And he said, this man is more learned than all of our learned men put together. And immediately said, yes, yeah, we, although you've already missed the deadline, we don't worry about that. You're going to be the delegate. You're going to be the deadlock. You're going to, you're, you will be the delegate for the Hindu um, representative. And so all that was fixed. And we have to thank, thank Kate Sanborn for that too. So after that, so we think, okay, all of Swamiji's problems have been solved. Huh. But no, because of course, Swamiji being Swamiji, his mind was always a very high pitch, gets on the train, he loses the address of the parliament. He has no idea where to go. So he arrives in Chicago, wanders around, has no idea where to go, sleeps in a boxcar overnight. Has, so he's wandering around in the day and just finally just, you know, surrenders to divine mother sits on a curb and who should look out but mary hale thank you mary hale Her, mary hale looks out the window sees the strangely dressed man and says goes out and says are you going to the parliament yes she said well please come in he's invited inside and that's like okay and then she says why don't you stay with us meanwhile she has four young women living in that house her two daughters and her two nieces would any person today do that i seriously doubt it i seriously doubt it and that family became critical in his success in america their house became his house their his that house became his headquarters when he was in america and they became his family he called him uh, mary hale became mother church and and the the father became father father pope and the daughters, the daughters and the nieces became like his own family and his own, they became very close to him. And the letters, especially that he wrote to Mary Hale are some of the most beautiful and revealing letters that we have. I mean, it shows just the depth of, of his feeling and also about how much th this family really meant to him. He said, he wrote to Mary Hale, accept your family along with Mrs. Bull and the Leggetts and a few other kind persons. Who else has been kind to me? Who came forward to help me work out my ideas? And we think about how hard it must have been for him. He comes to a foreign land, people are just looking at him like he's some sort of a monkey to be displayed in a zoo. Who comes forward to offer not only a place to stay, which is extraordinary, 
but help him work out his ideas to make things easy to lighten his load. And it's just wonderful. And then, the, and then he wrote Mary Hale, one of those beautiful letters ever. He says to her, may I be born again and again and suffer thousands of miseries so that I may worship the only God that exists, the only God I believe in. And above all, he said, which is the sum total of all souls. And above all, my God, the wicked, my God, the miserable, my God, the poor of all races, of all species, is the special object of my worship. To have received a letter like that with that kind of compelling vision of the unity of all, of all species even, not just humans, species. There's not species of humankind. There's only, yeah, all species is the special object, that enormous heart that embraces all, that's willing to be born again and again and again and suffer just for the sake of bringing light even to a few souls. That's the Swamiji that she's being shown. What a blessing. What a blessing for her. And that letter also mentions the Leggetts. And that included Frank Leggett, I have to say, our neighbor across the street, uh, who wanted to let uh, Catherine Whitmarsh was his daughter, granddaughter, and our former president of the Madonna Society, also a Leggett. That, that, that has also been there. Josephine McLeod was her aunt. So we, it's, it's a very close connection for us, especially in Southern California. So Frank, Frank Leggett was helped very, with all the publishing of all of Swamiji's books in this country. He paid for that along with Sarah Bull. You can write a book. How are you going to get it published? Who's going to pay for it? They're not going to give Swami Vivekananda who in advance. It was Frank Leggett that made sure they got published. Now, his wife was Betty Leggett, who was a devout disciple of Swami Vivekananda. Her sister, Josephine McLeod, was a powerhouse with Swami Vivekananda. Consider herself his friend. And she moved mountains to make sure that everything that Swamiji got, that that word of Swamiji would get out everywhere. That was her life's mission. Josephine McLeod was, oh, what, the other thing about the Leggetts was that his home became a refuge for him too in Upper State New York, richly. He stayed there for several weeks and he found rest because he became so exhausted from those. Sometimes he was, he was giving lectures two and three times a day and, and, and as saying, if you have questions, I will sit here until every one of your questions is answered, everyone. And he would do that for all of his talks and lectures. Can you imagine the exhaustion? So he did that for, for over a year. It must have been two years by the time he went up to their place. And then he went there for a rest. And that now is the property of the, uh, the empire of the Madonna Society of Southern California, who, of course, has a, has a, has a satellite in Ridgely, Upper State, New York. Yes, <laughs> along with Washington, D.C. and other satellites. But it's, if you've never been to Ridgely, highly recommend you go there. The, the atmosphere, you can, there is the sofa where Swamiji napped every day. And where Swami Turiananda was, Swami Sardananda was, Swami Bedananda was, and they all came together. It's, there's a, a photo of them together. It's quite extraordinary. Now, this was the home of Josephine McLeod and the other Leggetts. So you can be there where they all had fun together and Swamiji could just relax. There, it's the one picture of Swamiji grinning that is at, that is at Ridgely. So Swamp, Josephine McLeod played an enormous role in Swamiji's life. And Swamiji adored her. He said about her, he said, I simply adore Jo in her tact and her quiet way. He said, she is a feminine statesman. He said, she can wield a kingdom. He said, I have seldom seen such strong, common good sense in anyone, in a human, especially in a human being. She's the one who has such good common sense. And she made the spreading of Swamiji's message, especially his books, her personal goal in life. She lived for that and she would move mountains to do that. And she was very, very educated. 
she was highly cultured. She knew she came around in the highest levels of society. She spoke complete, like all high society women spoke fluent French and she knew all the right people in all the right places. So she can introduce this person to that person, to that person to make things happen. For example, the British government decided in their enormous wisdom that they were gonna take their railway line and put it right through Dakshineshwar. And in fact, right through the Panchavati. And she, of course, uh, Swami Shivananda probably was the one who get in touch with her. And so she decided that she was, she had made an appointment with, with, the, with the British, it must've been the, the consul general. So she already knew his wife convenient. <laughs> and they met and they had tea. And then she said, absolutely not. And then they put it someplace else. <laughs> you, see, you needed a person like Joseph because it was, of course, it was long before independence. This is long before 1947. And the British could do what they wanted. So you needed like someone, Josephine McLeod, who says, absolutely not. Put it somewhere else. All right. Thank you. <laughs> now my wife won't hound me about it. <laughs> but that's the type of person she was. She was so well connected that she could do enormous things. And she, for example, in 1935, she, she met Jean Hibert, who was a French scholar, a writer. And, he, and she liked him enormously. She, she gave him Swamiji. He loved Swamiji. And she, she said, you must translate the four yogas and the inspired talks into French. And she subsidized him to support him and his family while he took the time to do that. And because, and because of that, all those, all those books got into French. Then in 1936, during the centenary Sri Ramakrishna, they decided, okay, so, okay, we're gonna make sure that this is an event that happens. So there was an event at the Sorbonne, the great French university. So Josephine McLeod, went and spoke on Swamiji for five minutes, on Sri Ramakrishna and Swamiji for five minutes, and of course, perfect fluent French. And then Swami Yatish Rananda got up and he spoke for five minutes in English. Because of that meeting, they were able to start the first Vedanta Society, the Centre Vedanti Ramakrishna in Kretz, which is a suburb of, of Paris, because of that meeting in the Sorbonne. Now she hadn't finished with France yet, she said, she decided now she knew all the monks at Bellarmont and they and respected her enormously. So much to the fact that when she wore her shoes into the shrine, wow. they did not object because she said, I always rode, wore my shoes in front of Swamiji. And they went, <laughs> it's like she never took those shoes off. Another story I love was when she was fairly elderly. She went into Swamiji's room. She always was able to go into his room and just be with him long. Of course, this we're talking about the 40s, 50s, 40s, probably somewhere in the 40s. And she left the door ajar and she was in there a while. And a young Swami who was walking by was curious. And so he kind of turned back to look and she was dancing in front of Swamiji. And she, Josephine McLeod said, open, oh, she said, sometimes I feel such joy. I would just want to dance for him. Which is not what you think of this sort of like imperious woman, but she loved him so intensely that she just wanted to dance for him. So anyway, about France, she decided that she thought, ah, you know, I think the per perfect person would be Swami Sadeshwaranada. So she cabled Swami Shivananda and said, I think Swami Sadeshwaranada would be the perfect fit for our new French center. And, and she sent the money for the passage and off he went, he became the first head of the center. He was exactly what they needed. He was extraordinarily intelligent. He was an intellectual. He could speak to them on the intellectual level. He knew French mysticism. So he's perfect, but she was able to put the right person in the right place and be able to do it in such a way that it just, it was natural. It was natural. She also discovered Dhan Gopal Mukherjee, who was a professor at Stanford University. 
And she liked him immediately. So she gave him all the swam. You must read Swamiji. You must read. He liked it. So she said, you must write a life of Swamiji. I will support you while you do this. Well, he decided he was going to write about Sri Ramakrishna. So he wrote The Face of Silence, which is not what she really asked for, but it worked out just fine because that book fell into the hands of um, Romain Roland in Switzerland, who got the Nobel, had already received the Nobel Prize for Literature. And he liked that book very much. And then he wrote Swami Shivananda about it. Well, Josephine McLeod hears about it. She flies to, to, to Switzerland and joins him at his home in Switzerland and says, you must write about Sri Ramakrishna and Swami. You must write biographies of both Sri Ramakrishna and Swami Vivekananda. And she got him in touch again with Swami Shivananda, who got him in touch with Swami Ashokananda, who had such who knew everything about Swamiji and who had impeccable English. And it was that they had enormous correspondence going back and forth over both Sri Ramakrishna and Swamiji because of that connection of Joseph and McLeod. And that in, it meant that there would be a huge readership because Romain Roland was famous, already won the Nobel Prize. And so that guaranteed an audience, which was extremely important in those early days of kind of getting the message out to, to a larger audience. Because at, one, at a certain point, it, all, it had never quite seeped down. So to get it to a larger audience, you need to seep down, which means you need more people reading the books. Now, we have a hard time remembering now what was life before television, radio, or very few people using radio. What was like before the internet? Everybody read books. People, books were read. People went to the library. They bought books. They read books over and over again. Children would have books read to them in libraries. And this was considered to be something that was extremely important. Now we just want to have things given to us. We want to write, see things on a video. Not then. It was considered reading the book. And of course, all that started long back when the Bible became available to, to people in general, because before it had been in the hands of the church. When literacy started, when the Bible became available for reading, especially in the Protestant churches, which America was almost like 99% Protestant at that time, reading became a great value. So people got to, look, reading became a thing to do, to share with other people, to read together. The family sat around and read together, and they would sing hymns together. Well, after the Parliament of Religions, when these ideas started percolating into society, they began to read about other things. And books like Raja Yoga, all these things became widely available in libraries, and people in general would get a hold of them. And these are how the ideas came down. Swami Vivekananda loved Josephine McLeod. And he felt very easy with her. He felt like he could talk to her like he could talk to, talk to a friend. He wrote to her, he said, pray for me, Joe, that all my work stops forever and my whole soul be absorbed in mother. After all, Joe, I'm only the boy who used to sit and listen with rapt attention to the wonderful words of Ramakrishna under the banyan tree at Dakineshwar. He said, that is my true nature works and activities, doing good and so forth, those are all superimpositions. He said, now I again hear his voice, the same old voice thrilling my soul. He said, bonds are breaking, love dying, work becoming tasteless, the glamorous off life, only the voice of the master calling, I come, oh Lord, I come. Yes, I come. I'm glad I was born. Glad I suffered so. Glad I did make big blunders. Glad to enter peace. I leave none bound. I take no bonds. The guide, the guru, the leader, the teacher has passed away. The boy, the student, the servant is left behind. Can you imagine getting a letter like that? This is not that long before he died. When he was just like, at that point in his life, he was not making big decisions. 
you you all decide, you all decide, you all decide. There were such problems with the publication of Raj Yoga, for example, there was a British version and an American version. He just would not enter into it. It's like, oh, shall Abeda not be here since why would not? You figure it out. Leave me out of it. Leave me out of it. He'd had it. Like, how much? Oh, are we okay? Yeah, we're okay with time. Okay. Like Josephine McLeod, Sarah Bull, who is often referred to as Mrs. Holy Bull, but I think she's a lot more important than her, than her, than Mr. Holy Bull, her husband who passed away many years. He was, he was the, if you want to see something interesting, they have his violin at the Smithsonian Museum in, in Washington, D.C. It's like the they never they never call him Mr. Sarah Bull. <laughs> but, but she was she was like either 16 or 18 when she married him. She was the daughter of the governor of Wisconsin. Very highly born, very well educated, and she adored Oli Bull. He was high-minded, he was deeply spiritual, he was a Norwegian patriot. And it put her into a world that she loved and she deeply grieved when he died. He was many years, many years, decades older than her, but he died much earlier than her. And then when she met Swami Vivekananda, her life was, it made, she always had, she was extremely intellectual and always had like meetings at her home in Cambridge, uh, America, right, right in the Boston area, had these um, soirees and things where people could, intellectuals could meet and get together, but her life changed enormously. When she met Swami Vivekananda, happily, she was very close friends with Josephine McLeod, who kind of made everything happen. So like Josephine McLeod, Sarah Bull also had the capability of making things happen because she knew the right people and the right places and how to make the Vedanta work grow. She was really like Josephine McLeod, just critical in making the, the, the work grow actually around the world, around the world, they had that kind of capability. He said, Swami Vivekananda said about her, he said, Mrs. Bull and a few other ladies here are not only sincere and love me, but they have a power to do as leaders in society. You see, that makes the difference at that point between India and the United States. Women at that point in India could not be leaders of society. They had a definite... They definitely were, were behind the other side of, of, the, of, the, of the veil, of the, of the wall. They, they couldn't be, but women in America could because of their position, their money, their education, and their ability to make things happen. And Sarah Bull was one of those incredible people, but also she was the intellectual equal of many of these great intellectuals. And they knew it and they respected her for it. So Sarah Bull invited Swamiji to come to her home in Cambridge. It was in 1894, pretty early on. And because of that, he participated in her Cambridge conferences, which were really intellectually important. And all the top minds of Harvard went there to share ideas. So she invited him there. And it was like electricity being, being you know, between one, one person and another. There, the ideas were just flying and these connections were made. And it was there that he met William James, who wrote the seminal book, The Varieties of Rich Religious Experience, which was the first book ever on, um, it was a, sort of a, fem, a seminal book in psychology, but also for religious studies. There were no religious studies um, in that country. There were divinity classes to teach to become preachers, but there were no studies in religion general. This was the first book that would even talked about that. So he was, William James was so fascinated by Swamiji, he quotes Raja Yoga at length. So any student, and that is being read, read even today, it's been in continual print since I think 1899, I believe that's the date, continually in print being used and read by students and graduate students, not only in psychology, religious studies, a forerunning book. And he said, uh, when he met her, he wrote her this letter very quickly after he met her. He said, through the mercy of Ramakrishna, my instinct sizes up almost infallibly, a human face as soon as I see it. The result of that is this. 
you may do anything you please with my affairs. I will not even murmur. I regard you as my mother, and I will always abide by any advice you have for me. And he kept that to a letter. Through Sarah Bull's influence, he was invited to speak to the students and the faculty of Harvard University. And because of the Harvard University's philosophical school, that was in 1896, and that talk was later published as Vedanta Philosophy, still in print, still we sell it in our bookstore, as it's as relevant now as it was in 1896. Because of Sarah Bull, that happened. And she was wealthy, Sarah Bull was wealthy, and she was generous, and she funded an enormous amount of Swamiji's work in the West and in India. She funded a lot of his work in India, including J.C. Bose. She funded a lot of his work there. And Nevedita might have been his soldier, and Christina, Sister Christine, was really his daughter. But Sarah Bull, he saw literally as his mother, as his mother. He had that much regard for her. And she literally saw him as her son and treated him exactly as her son. She had this incredibly motherly feeling, which she felt instantly when she met him. And, and he, he told, so much he told Sister Christine that Sarah Bull is a, a real saint if there ever was one. And Swamiji was once asked, Swamiji, uh, he said, um, have you ever met a saint? And he said, yes, Sarah Bull. He said, it's a pilgrimage to meet a person like her. Now, when we think of her today, we think of her, you know, as a, a wealthy, cultured woman who was a, maybe a socialite. No, Swamiji put her in an entirely different light, a pilgrimage to see her. He said, she is a great, great woman. So Nevedita wrote that in Sarah Bull, I'm quoting Nevedita here, Swamiji's cause had found a mother. He said, no one else had her sense of responsibility, foresight, and wisdom. Sarah Bull. And Swamiji, this is a even When I think of it, it just blows my mind. Such an American expression, but he put her in charge of all the Madonna societies in America. You're in charge. Not Swami Abedananda, not Swami Sardananda, not Swami Turiananda. He put her. Not Goodwin, who had, be, who had taken Brahmacharya vows by then. He put her in charge of all the Madonna societies in the United States, Sarah Bull. I mean, I would love to know what all a single th thought about that. <laughs> it's like, and he said, that's why he gave her the ochre cloth of, of sannyasa. He recognized her for her real, who she, who she was, her svabhava, who she really was. So he wrote her, he said, you have my implicit confidence in all works in the U.S., and I trust everything to you. As a matter of fact, in his will, he entrusted a lot to Oli Bull. I'm mean, sorry, to uh, Sarah Bull, to her, and I think to Nevedita and the rest, those two, and then the rest of the mission. Because he knew that they would use it for the work in the most responsible way possible. Can you imagine? He said, uh, in 1899, he wrote, or he said, recent developments prove that you are appointed by the mother to watch over my life. As regards me and my work, I hold henceforth that you are inspired, and I will gladly shake off all responsibilities from my shoulder and abide by whatever the mother ordains through you. When I read that, I go, what? What about, what about your brother monks? But no, it was her. And he said, because I've continually asked myself, why, why? And then I came upon this sentence. He said to her, he wrote her a letter. He said, you have been the one friend with whom Rama, Sri Ramakrishna has become the goal of life. Of all the people in America, all the many people he actually gave initiation to, to took personal responsibility for, all of his disciples, the one person to whom Sri Ramakrishna has become the goal of their life. That was her. And he said, that is the secret of my trust in you. Of all his disciples, she was the only one. Not Christine, not Nivedita. They remained Christian all their life. All these people, and, and he appreciated that. They stayed, but with her, 
it was like Sri Ramakrishna became the goal of her life. And that was why he had such great trust in her. That became her life's ideal, Sri Ramakrishna. So at this point, we need to backpack. I'm backpack to kind of back up because there's other women that I want to talk about. But I think for this session, that's enough. Okay, so we can take a break. Let's have some tea. And we'll come back in an hour. Is that? No, we'll come back at, uh, what, 6.30. Okay, let's have some tea in an hour. Okay, all right. See you in an hour. Ciao.